I've worked on Old Oak Common for five odd years, so do have quite a good understanding of the scheme, particularly um, what I'll be talking about tonight. So do feel free to ask questions about any topics that might interest you. If I can't answer them, ultimately I'll take them away and come back. Today, uh, I'll be primarily focusing on Old Oak Common. I will start with a very brief overview of High Speed 2. I'm sure everybody knows High Speed 2, but just to set context for the, talk, for the talk today, I'll sort of explain where's Old Oak Common and where do we fit into the puzzle. Um, primarily a focus today on what does it look like, what's the scheme, um, where are we now in terms of construction, and what does sort of the next few years look like at Old Oak Common. So the HS2 overview bit, which I'm sure some of you, many of you know quite well, uh, very much high speed, of course, but really about carbon connectivity and capacity. You'll have heard those buzzwords before, but really that's what the, uh, the HS2 program will deliver. There's an awful lot of press on it and there's an awful lot of uncertainty that people like to throw out there. But in terms of delivery, we're very much focused on the ground at building what we're trying to deliver for uh, Old Oak Common and for phase one. Delivery is in multiple phases. You'll hear, hear that terminology. Phase one is just the first of the tranches, which is between London and Birmingham. Then there's phase 2A, which is a small extension to crew, shown in purple. And then there's the phase 2B bit, which is the Manchester link, which is getting a lot of press at the moment. One of the things that perhaps a lot of people don't realise or don't appreciate is that's the new infrastructure that's being built, part of HS2. But the capability of what HS2 will do will allow trains to start in London and connect into conventional network and run all the way up to Scotland uh, and also still run to the east of the country. It's just not going to be necessarily new sections of track in those areas. So that's something I think that something's a misconception. And in phase one alone, so that's just the London to Birmingham bit, there are 350 live sites. So that's on site where we are at the moment, Old Oak Common. We get a lot of people coming who say, oh, didn't realise you were this far progressed, didn't realise where you were with construction. We've got a thousand people at Old Oak Common alone and across the route, we've got 350 active sites ranging from big ones like tunnel boring machines like you can see behind us to smaller ones, uh, some sort of embankment works, etc. I'm going to start just by playing this video just because it gives a context of where the HS2 program is as a whole. And this is just uh, an update video that the CEO of HS2 gave last month, I think. I'm bringing you our latest update on the delivery of the program here at Bromford Tunnel site, just at the heart of the program in the West Midlands. Since our last update in January, the government has updated how we're going to some of its major transport infrastructure programs, including HS2, over the next few years. Following those updates, we've worked our construction partners to agree changes to when we will be delivering some parts of our work. Importantly, the government reaffirmed its commitment to deliver an HS2 from Houston all the way to Manchester. And the bill to take high speed rail to Manchester continues to work its way through Parliament. On the ground, our priority is to maintain the fantastic momentum we've built to ensure the initial high speed services connecting our super hub stations at Old Oak Common and Birmingham and Curtin Street are operating by the early 2030s. And today, the HS2 programme is supporting over 28,500 jobs right across the country. And really pleasing and important to me is that we've already seen over 1,200 apprentices start their careers on HS2. But I'm here today, we have Mary Ann, our sixth giant sun machine, which is about to start her two and a half mile day, that will take high speed trains towards the centre of Birmingham and towards our hot station at Curtis Street. To date, we've built over 18 miles of tunnels on the section between London and the West Midlands, including completion of the twin port tunnels at Longish and St. Wood. Construction continues to progress at many of our key biodat sites on the route, and we're starting to see those main structures come out of the ground and really start to take shape. Passengers passing through Birmingham on the train will see the huge fears for the curves and biodats, and our team there is preparing to install the first section of the main deck for that biodat later this summer. Our print glass factory near Kingsbury is in full production, with over 150 segments already cast, and these will be used to create what we call Delta Junction. Triangle of Viaducts will allow HS2 trains to travel from Birmingham, south of London, and north from the West Midlands to the northwest. Major components have already been delivered for our Tang Valley and Wendover Dean sites in Buckinghamshire as the team is there prepared to assemble the Viaducts. And on the outskirts of London, 
that the one kilometre that the Pond Valley Viaduct is already built. And the team are moving into the next phase of construction as the structure starts to cross the lakes. I will have comment our construction teams will have to sit dedicated HS2 platforms some 20 metres below ground level. I'm also really pleased to be able to confirm that 19 HS2 construction sites are now entirely diesel free. A fantastic achievement ahead of our target events. And this is showcasing how the project is changing established ways of working and accelerating the adoption of best practice throughout the UK construction industry. And of course, there are wider benefits beyond what we've seen today. Over 3,000 UK businesses who have done these together are already helping deliver these milestones and bring HS2 a whole network to life. This summer, we'll be announcing more contract opportunities, opening the door hundreds more businesses to join those already working on the programme. It's an exciting time as attention now turns to creating the structures that will become the stations and building completed trains that will transform the way we travel across our country. Our stations in some of the most environmentally friendly buildings in the UK. HS2 trains will be some of the fastest, quietest, and most energy efficient high speed trains operating anywhere in the world. They'll offer zero carbon journeys to some of our biggest cities, bringing jobs and opportunities with them. We have a two decade construction program areas, from Victor Railway all the way to the northwest into Manchester. That's thousands more jobs, thousands more contract opportunities going to British businesses, laying the foundations for the arrival of more new rail services into the next decade and well beyond. I hope you've enjoyed this latest update and I look forward to bringing you more updates as we continue to deliver HS2. Thanks very much. If you enjoyed this video, so if you can excuse the music video, which often sort of covers those kind of videos, but hopefully that just gives you a feel for, you know, what, what sort of is happening wider than Old Oak Common and contextualise some of what I'll talk about today. So Old Oak Common, we call it a super hub. That's because it is very much a hub in terms of the connectivity it uh, releases in, in northwest London. And that's both regional, so as in locally within the area, there's an awful lot of development that will come online as a result of the station and also the physical rail interchange facilities that we're providing as a station. Where is it? Which is often the question. Um, so obviously on the route map, it's down near the bottom, located in, in sort of northwest London and locally within the uh, within this sort of rail infrastructure world, Old Oak Common sits close to North Acton and East Acton, Wilson Junction, existing stations, but none of them are that close. They're all 10, 15 minute walking distance away. Um, and it's crucially providing the connectivity between the HS2 route, which is underground at this site, and the conventional network where the Elizabeth Line services and Great Western Main Line Heathrow Express services run at ground level. Uh, and that interchange is the critical component of what it, what it offers. Uh, you'll notice this is an old image. There's, there are some proposed overground stations also that are being looked at by TfL as part of the wider sort of uh, local development shown in uh, Old Oak Common Lane and Hyde Road, uh, but that's subject to sort of separate funding and separate um, business case development. And then in practice, if you take a drone shot of site, this is what it looks like. So in terms of the area we're dealing with, it's very much rail, up rail locked, rail sort of surrounded. So to the north, we've got the new Elizabeth Line Depot, which has been built to support Crossrail. To the south, we've got the live operational main lines, uh, four track railway running through to Paddington for the Great Western and Heathrow Express services. And further south to that, we have the Hitachi IEP Depot. To the west of us, we have our only access to site, which is the yellow Old Oak Common Lane, which if you know the area is very, very narrow. It's a single lane directional uh, sort of uh, road and infrastructure, which really is one of the kind of things that we have to manage from a site logistics perspective. Um, and we have the North London Line, the London Overground running effectively north-south through the site. We do have some residents near us. There's the Wells House Road residents that interestingly enough, uh, those houses were built to support the original depots that were on the site. So 1908, I think they were constructed and they have still have sort of very rail sort of heritage associated with those houses, uh, which is good. And ultimately, they will then be the sort of on the doorstep of the new station, which is fantastic. We haven't had to displace any sort of residents as part of the Old Oak Common Scheme, which is great because all the land we're using was 
uh, network rail land or DFT owned land before, uh, which is where the Great Western Main Lo Line and Heathrow Express service maintenance depots were. And as part of what we've done, we've sort of cleared those as part of the enabling works. And to the south, Wormwood Scrubs, you can see. So off the bottom of the page is the Wormwood Scrubs prison, which you may have heard recently is where gentlemen was escaped from. But that's just out the, uh, out the corner of where we're working on site. Uh, we don't really have too much interface with the Wormwood Scrubs, but we did have some enabling works with utilities that we needed to manage carefully, given the, the heritage um, of that area. And in black, the dotted lines indicatively shows where the high speed two tunnels are coming underground through the site and will ultimately connect into the underground box, which I'll explain in a minute. Wider, so this is locally, Old Oak Common site again shown there in red triangle. As part of what is happening in the area, there is a plan to develop massively the area, uh, sort of similar to Stratford and a similar model actually to the London Olympic um, model in terms of how the planning rules are being managed. So Old Oak and Park Royal Development Corp Corporation has been set up. That company has the responsibility to manage all of the planning within the area, within that space there, such that the master plan will fit in with new station uh, and the wider development and it won't be piecemeal because we're quite unique here where we've got three boroughs intersecting directly at our site Hammersmith and Fulham, Ealing and Brent so naturally that could cause conflict if we didn't have an overarching kind of planning um, authority and the intention 50, 56,000 new jobs 25,000 new homes in that area so it will be very changed from its current state which is actually not really a destination at the moment it's very much people live there but they leave to go to work in all other parts of London so how do we actually build Old Oak Common? This short video gives a bit of a summary of what we're doing and how we're going to build it. At Old Oak Common in West London, construction has started on what will be the biggest newly built railway station in the UK. The construction of the station will be a feat of engineering and will be carried out in three main phases. In the first phase, the underground part of the station will be built what we call the box. This is where six high-speed platforms will be located, serving the Midlands and the North. To build it, a 1.8-kilometre underground concrete wall will be installed around the perimeter of the underground box, and 160 steel reinforced concrete columns will be installed to help form the box and support the structure. Concrete beams will be cast on top tying all the elements together to form a large concrete structure. This will then allow the earth inside to be removed safely. The amount of earth taken out of the box will be enough to fill nearly 300 Olympic-sized swimming pools. In the second phase, as the excavation of the underground box is taking place, work on the eight overground platforms will begin. Over 1,600 concrete piles will be installed into the ground on which the station superstructure and overground platforms will sit. These platforms will then allow the Elizabeth Line and Great Western Mainline services to stop at the station. As the high speed platforms and the overground platforms have been completed, the high speed two station and the surrounding urban area is built, the third and final stage. The main element of the station will be its immense roof, covering the area of over three football pitches. The lightweight roof structure has been designed to minimise the use of materials and allows much natural lighting, which reduces the carbon impact of the station. To further boost its environmental credentials, the roof will be covered with solar panels, generating a supply of renewable energy for the station. This curved design of the roof brings together the rail lights under one unified building, creating a common experience for the passengers, turning it into one super hub station. With over 250,000 passengers using the station every day, Old Oak Common will be the best connected and largest new build station in the UK, making it one of the country's most vital transport hubs and a catalyst for economic regeneration for the area and the rest of the UK. Voila. So, so that's what we're trying to achieve. Looks simple, but in reality, obviously, well, hopefully, trying to explain is, is a bit more complicated than that. So a couple of sort of images of the design, sort of concepts of what the design's all about. Here's an image of the end state um, scheme in terms of what we're trying to achieve. You can see in the middle, the main building, Old Oak Common Station, 
Crucially, it is one station, even though it is providing obviously high speed two and the Great Western Main Line and Elizabeth Line connectivity. So the intention and the ethos about design is very much one station, one look and feel, one passenger experience. That's where the majority of actual movements in the station will be, which is between the transport modes. But there will be people coming in out the front door. And obviously, as the development grows, that will only increase. So we've got the intermodal area out the front door that you can see there, which is providing buses, taxis, and all of the usual private drop-off facilities you'd expect. This area in grey is left in grey just because when we leave the site as the construction team for the railway, that's what we leave. However, in reality, it's going to become one of the key parts of the development. So there'll be a development here, commercial, residential, mixed use, to be determined exactly what that'll look like. But there'll be a development there which will have access directly to the station, which is key. And then underground beneath all of this is the high speed two trains. So you don't see them here, but they are running underneath the ground. From a design perspective, one of the interesting things that happened early in the phase was to look at how we we're going to ventilate the HS2 box beneath the ground. Initial concept of the scheme was to have a naturally, vent natu naturally ventilated station throughout. So have lots of openings throughout the station in, in order to manage the natural ventilation and minimize obviously the amount of forced ventilation from an energy pers uh, production perspective. But the west box, as we can see it here, this west end of the station was ultimately decided to slab over to give us maximum use of this urban realm and also to maximize the potential for the development to, to be what it needs to be in future. So that was kind of an early decision which uh, really benefited to the scheme in terms of what we can provide for the local passengers, but also the onward connectivity through buses and other services. And crucially, the buses there currently, are they're shown double-decker, they cannot get there today via double-deckers because the bridges locally are too low. So another part of the scheme that we're delivering is lowering the road in order to facilitate the buses to get to the station. Sounds simple, apart from there's 18 utilities in the road. So diverting, first of all, tunneling underneath the live operational main, main uh, conventional station with nine UTXs, then diverting the utilities through those UTXs before we lower the road by two and a half metres before we reinstate elements of those back in the road. So that sort of small element of a bus on the image is, is quite a crucial part of what we're trying to achieve outside of the station element, uh, but it's critical to ultimately unlocking um, the, the, the wider development. And, and obviously, we are hemmed in by uh, our rail infrastructure constraints. And this image sort of gives an illusion that we can build the whole station kind of today as we have it at the moment. However, what's not shown here is the fact that the existing main operational railway is running through what we call platforms one and two, these platforms here. So the four track railway between Paddington and Southwest is going through that at the moment. So clearly, we can't build that element of the scheme. So what we do instead is we build six platforms offline, the northern six platforms first. We then divert the trains non-stopping through those platforms to release the final phase of the construction of the last two platforms. So that's why we particularly, and when you look at some of the construction sort of images, you think we're quite progressed in some areas of construction. We need to be because ultimately 2026, 27, we're going to have passengers coming through the platforms at ground level at Old Oak Common, not stopping, but obviously that facilitates our ability to build the remaining two platforms. And a couple of stats for you. So this is a section through the box. So on the left hand side, high speed two services underground. On the right hand side, the conventional station services. So we've got six platforms, high speed two. They're 400 meters long. So that's twice the length of the Elizabeth line. Um, they can run for those who probably know more than me, but they can run in configuration of your 200 meters or 400 meter trains in HS2 services. So it'll be two, two sets of 200 or 400 trains. We've got the big roof, which we talked about in the video, which is actually trying to sort of span the whole um, station to kind of provide that connectivity and, and natural wayfinding. We've got a lot of lifts and escalators. That's often a surprise to people, but naturally a lot of those are back of house, emergency, evacuation, etc. So they're all required not all 52 lifts will be publicly accessible but they are all ultimately required to deliver the station you heard lots of solar panels so we're utilizing the area on the roof to maximize solar gain and actually quite cleverly the designs um the design of the roof lights is orientated such that all of the solar panels the pv cells are south facing 
to maximize how much we can get from those. And all of the glazed elements, the roof lights are north facing to minimize the heat gain we get within the station to try and reduce the amount of cooling we need to do in hot parts of the station. And on the conventional side, then on the right there, eight traditional, I think they're not quite 250, but roughly 250 meters in length in terms of those platforms. Crucially, you can see there's a delineation in the middle that's looking at the ownership split ultimately between who's going to own what. So one of the big complexities we have at Auto Common, we have two ultimate asset owners, which for those who worked on schemes like that before, know it's a headache, but that's part of what we have to deliver in order to successfully um, deliver Auto Common with Network Rail operating and owning the right-hand side, the conventional station ultimately, and HS2, whatever form that looks like in terms of an operational body, managing and operating the left. Some key to design features, I think we talked about some of these, but it is primarily an interchange station, providing that interchange between those facilities. Up to 250,000 passengers per day in terms of uh, that's what it looks like when we've got phase 2B full build out. But because we're temporary terminus at Old Oak Common, because Houston's not going to be online as early, we will have sort of that demand, not in our numbers, but in waves for, for day one, because we've now got sort of a different condition to the original design. The station, though, is, is more than capable of dealing with those passengers, which is good. Very much a one station experience and design ethos. As I said, there's two parts, two owners, but very much working as part of an integrated team with Network Rail so that we don't have two different floor tiles or two different you know, systems, which could happen if not careful. So the strategy is single maintainer, single operator in terms of station operational function, but there will be two bodies in, as part of that team. The public realm on the left looks always small on images, but it is actually three size, see trying to size of Trafalgar Square. So it's a real good space that we can give back to the community and also will be used by the development, which on this image in front of you will be to the right. And yeah, I mentioned the other two elements there already. Sort of exploded view, spun round slightly. Uh, so you can see one of the main engineering bits of this station is the underground box, which is described in the video. It's 900 meters long, so it's a massive engineering kind of challenge. We are very much well on the way of that. We've dug 50% of all of the earth, so poured all the concrete, dug all 50% of the earth now out of that box. So we're very much on with that challenge, but it's a big, big sort of early element of the scheme that we need to deliver to, to allow the trains and ultimately the rail systems teams to come in and deliver their works. Um, yeah, and I think you can just get a sense of the kind of where the station sits there. It's actually set back about 400 metres from the road. So it's not hard up against the road, set back. And that's to provide optimum interconnectivity between the, the modes. So minimise the journey time and, and maximise the, uh, the interchange connectivity between those modes. A couple of nice CGI's. Um, uh, this is probably a very good representation, raining like tonight, um, but there we are. That's what the old Oak Common Station will look like as you walk towards it. It looks a lot taller here than on any of the other images I've shown because they're always shown from above. So I think that's the thing that always strikes me. The height of this structure is actually still quite high and that's so that it ultimately can span across both parts of the station. When you walk inside, this is sort of in the front door. This is what you'll see. On the left hand side, you've got the HS2 services and then you'll go up the escalators or lifts on your right and over to get into the conventional services. So some things to note on the left hand side, you can see there's kind of zoning. Potentially you see there's indication zoning. So HS2 strategy at the moment around how we're going to uh, manage seating on HS2 services is around kind of you have a you'll have a ticketed service. So it'll be fully ticketed. You'll know your seat and you'll be directed through zoning to minimize those walking distances and uh, minimize journey times, um, given you've got 400 meter long trains. And we're trying to manage passenger movements as efficiently as possible. And then on the right hand side, what's not really shown, but this is where all sort of the customer interfacing parts are. There'll be retail, there'll be um, yeah, toilets, all that kind of typical stuff. Some people say it's very airport style. Everybody has a different view as to whether they like it or not, but uh, it is quite an impressive piece of engineering and it'll be certainly unique and stand out in terms of uh, you'll recognize it once it's built. On the platforms, this is the high speed two platforms below grounds is a sort of view of what you'll see. 
So a couple of things to note, single escalators down about 15 meters to platforms. So uh, relatively long, but um, not the longest escalators uh, around. Uh, you'll notice quite a lot of openings where possible to let that daylight down. So we're trying to minimize the amount of artificial lighting we need to use. But of course, we do need to do that to maintain the, uh, the lux down there. On the right hand side, you'll see platform edge doors. So the intention here, although common is to provide full height platform edge doors, not to the ceiling when I say full height. So but but yeah, full height in terms of a passenger. And that's primarily for when it's the interchange station. So obviously in the interim, when Houston's not open, temporary terminus, there won't be, there'll be trains waiting when you get there. So there won't be the need for the platform edge protection as much, but in the final end state, once trains are through running uh, and we've got 17 trains an hour running through Old Oak Common, that's when they'll really come into their own. Uh, and I think the term expressed engineering is used for this kind of structure, isn't it? So you can see the props, you can see it sort of the structural elements. They're not they're not hidden per se. On the conventional platforms, so at ground level, this is sort of a look and feel for what you'll see. Similar, some people say similar to Reading because of the overbridge, quite similar to Reading. Um, likewise, some people say similar to the London Bridge in terms of the canopy design. So that's similar look and feel. Quite traditional network rail look and feel, and obviously that's in keeping with what they would like to achieve uh, for the station. Unfortunately, we weren't able to have straight platforms because of the alignment through the station. So we do have a slight camber, but it's it's not um, it's not too significant in terms of the curvature. An old common lane. It's a very simple image here. It looks very boring, but in order to enable that, in order to enable that bus under, we have to obviously lower the road. As I said, significant piece of work. We've also got to build new bridges. So the bridge that you see in the foreground is a new bridge that's allowing the tracks to be wider as they go over the bridge. So an awful lot of sort of off-site works that are needed to enable the new railway and the new connections to the bus infrastructure network. So in terms of project status, where are we today? From a design perspective, we're pretty much done with the sort of main lead designer. So WSP, they're our designer for the Old Oak Common Station, very much completing this year all of the substantive design. So that's civils, MEP, fit out, et cetera. And so we're very much on the way with subcontractor fabrication design now, particularly for the civils elements, which you'll see we're building, but that's now changing. We're in the next phase, fit out phase is coming. Procurement. So we have a construction partner at Old Oak Common. So we've built uh, a sort of framework that is a single contract with a joint venture partner, BBVS, Alpha BT Vinci Sistra, who then des design and build the station on behalf of HS2. They were appointed 2019, so four years ago now, completed the enabling works and the early civils works to where we got to. And they've also awarded now over 50% of the subcontracts for the various packages. And so by you know, by the end of next year, we'll very much be near 100% in terms of the subcontract procurement piece. So very much in full delivery mode of the station construction. And in the construction itself, enabling works are now complete. So all of those enabling bits, removable sheds, getting rid of all of the asbestos that we had in the ground and all of that sort of dirty stuff that we had, we've now got rid of. And we're building in earnest on, on the site. Uh, Civil's bond way and fit out an MEP will commence next year. So this is what it looked like before. So before we arrived, this was the old Great Western sheds to the north and the Heathrow Express shed here to the south. So all of that was ultimately relocated or moved elsewhere or, or decided to manage the rolling stock differently so that we could clear the site and we could ultimately start building the, the station. And that's a drone shot today. So it may not look that different in sort of macro scale, but it's when you look closer, there's an awful lot of change. You can see this long underground structure now being built. Um, you can see the site accommodation building, which is actually quite sizable, given the number of people we've got, like say a thousand people on the site every day. And you can also see this conveyor, which is a key element of what we've done for the enabling. It runs around the back here all the way up to, to Wilson Euro Terminal, where there's a railhead. So we take all the soil that we're digging out of that box, we put it on a conveyor. It's about three kilometers runs around the back of the pro properties out of sight out of mind to Wilson Euro Terminal where it then gets loaded onto trains. Other conveyors from the tunneling sites also join at that point 
and we take it to backfill quarries in Essex, Kent, and other areas um, to make meanwhile use for those spaces. Uh, so that that that's really all about getting vehicles off the road and minimising the uh, obviously the diesel footprint we have. But that conveyor for us alone will take 100,000 vehicles, heavy goods vehicles, off that old oak common lane, which, as I've described, is a single lane, very constrained um, element of the, of the site. So that's really crucial in order to, to deliver the works efficiently. And a short video, some of which you saw before, but here's a drone going down into the box that we've now built. So you get a sense of how below, far below ground the high-speed two platforms are here. And you can see the civils is very much the focus at the moment. Well underway here, digging all of that lovely clay. This is predominantly clay that we've got here. And you get a sense of some of the scale of that structure. Flying on above, you get a sense again of how there's a, a, a main line train running through the Elizabeth line, uh, very close to our site. So we've got real constraints in terms of lifting and other operations that we're doing will have to be very controlled and there's the conveyor on the left here which you can see snaking its way around site accommodation building and an awful lot of works going on it's a big big site but we don't really have much space in terms of the construction challenges i've talked through some of these but some i haven't so far the first one is we're actually launching the tunnel boring machines towards Euston from the east end of our site. So we dig the big hole and then that's the launch chamber for the tunnel boring machines. And as you might get a sense from this image, but also from the drone footage, it's very narrow down that end. It's the narrowest part of the job. Massive, massive tunnel boring machines, nine and a half meter diameter tunnel boring machines. So it's a big engineering challenge, but we're well on the way to doing that. And in fact, they're We'll be handing over that part of the site in November, December this year to enable them to start all of the enabling works for those TBMs. There's lots of stuff in the press around this in particular because there's terminology like we're burying the tunnelers at Old Oak Common. That's really around the fact that we need to drop those tunnel boring machines still in the hole uh, and we'll, we'll leave them in the hole for six months or so before ultimately they'll, when the decision is made to restart the tunneling towards Houston, they will go. But we need to do that because if we don't put them in the hole, can't put these lovely new railways on the surface that we need to enable before we change the train, uh, we move the trains over uh, in 26, 27. The network rail sequencing I mentioned, but that is not to be underestimated and moving the line. So you get sense here, the current main lines are in the orange section. They will be diverted into the platforms we're building offline. And then those ultimately will unlock the ability to build the final two platforms. And significant possessions required in Christmas time, roughly uh, 2026, 2028, in order to connect in the new uh, new railway alignments. Um, so that sort of block ultimately what we're because of where we are, we're blocking access into Paddington. Lots of work, therefore, with Network Rail DFT to look at how we're going to manage that the access mitigation strategy um, to minimise the effect on passengers, and from an engineering perspective, also minimise the amount of work we need to do in those periods. Third big challenge, I've mentioned it a few times, logistics. Um, the earth itself, yeah, we've got a million meters cubed. That's a big sort of number. It's a lot. <laughs> um, it's 300 Olympic swimming pools, or the one I like to use, it's 2.3 billion of those ball pit balls that you go to kids' play areas with. So, uh, you know, it's it's a sort of scale that you almost can't get your head around until you kind of see it and get, get underground and, and get a feel for it on site. And we only have that one entrance in and out uh, so we've got to be very careful with how we're managing everything from the utility diversions on those roads, which allow us to use the road. And that road is actually very heavily used by local traffic, so it needs to be maintained throughout the works. And last but not least, obviously the high speed two rail systems, which will be in the box, in the station, but massively crucial. And at Oldo Common, there's about eight contracts that interface with us. So there'll be like not traction power, comms, signaling, etc. Each one is being procured individually, but then forming an alliance, rail systems alliance within the HS2 program to sort of make sure we make best for program decisions across all of those contracts and the station 
to, to ultimately try and integrate the station as efficiently as possible. Naturally, everyone talks about Crossrail at this point in terms of trying to learn the lessons. It's challenging. That's the reality. We are, of course, trying to learn those lessons, talk about systems integration now, but it's still not going to be an easy thing to do, particularly given the ownership split that we have at Old Oak Common with the network rail and high-speed two sides of the station. And I've just got a couple of slides about sort of how we're structured, Team Old Oak, as we call it. So we have what's called an integrated project team. It's very common for major projects now to do this kind of model where very much it's, it's client and contractor and supply chain working as collaboratively as possible to deliver the scheme because risks, issues are just going to happen. They're going to pop up that you cannot envisage early on in the contract. So we specifically stood up an integrated project team also that includes network rail. They're not the delivery um, body obviously is part of what we're doing, but they're crucial in order to allow us to deliver what we're doing. So it includes Network Rail, WSP is the lead designer, HS2, and then our main contractor, which is Balfour Beatty, Vinci, Sistra. And just even at the moment on Old Oak Common, we've got those parties working. But I think it's just to show really the supply chain is really what builds uh, the, the station and HS2 as a whole. So I think it's quite um, yeah, quite relevant to think of how many people and subcontracts ultimately we're going to have to deliver the works at Old Oak Common. And whilst everyone's been sleeping, <laughs> I've got a couple of fun facts to hopefully wake you up. So, how many metres of cable management system will there be in the Old Oak Common station? I'm not talking cables, just cable management system, so just the CMS itself. Any guesses around the room? 3,000, good guess. 120,000, 120 kilometers worth of CMS to install. So that's half the way to Birmingham as well, if we laid that all out in a simple, single line. So massive, massive undertaking in its own right. But obviously that's just one part of what we're doing. And similarly, how many luminaires will there be in the station? Just old oak common, any guesses? No guesses. 22,000. Or... Oh, that's not a bad guess, actually. I've had some very strange answers before to that sort of one from five to five million. So I think that's a pretty good guess. 22,000 or equivalent to sort of 350 homes worth. So it's just the scale. Sometimes it's hard to get across. Um, but really, that is the challenge that I have to try and wrestle with daily. Um, but an interesting one. I mean, a, an amazing uh, project really to be part of. And what's next? So I've mentioned this a bit, but next year, 2024, really it's all about getting the final contracts on board at Old Oak Common. So those subcontracts for the mechanical, electrical, public health, and all the fit out packages will be awarded, as well as some of those key utility diversions that we need to do early. Then in 2025, that's when we'll be doing the tunnel breakthroughs. So at the West End, we'll be tunneling into the box. And at the East End, they'll be tunneling out of it with the TBMs. So that's quite critical for the civils. And then 26, that's when we have those critical rail positions on the conventional station. So that's really not far away. Um, as much as everyone likes to think things are still a long way away, that's really not far away. So we have a very clear drive to hit that milestone and do an awful lot of work before that to unlock that position. And then from 26 onwards, we're doing, as you'd expect, all station rail systems install, testing and commissioning which takes us up to early 2030s, you know, 2031 to three really is the sort of time frame. But uh, we're, we're trying to hit that front end of that, of course. But we're also conscious that these programs face challenges as they get towards that milestone. And I think that was all I was going to cover. So I think I'll pause at that point and open them to the floor for questions. Um, I think so with the um, audience here online, I think we've got questions in the room, I'll pass the mic. Um we'd like to go first. <laughs> okay.
that. A good presentation. Kevin Moore, our TFL. Um, can you tell us more about the train, the high speed train servicing arrangements at um, Old Oak Common? Servicing in terms of, uh, in terms of stuff on and off trains in that? Yeah, in terms of catering, etc. It would have been done at Euston, presumably at the terminus, but yeah. uh, now we've been done at Old Oak. Is yeah, that, so we that? have a what we have is a sort of temp what you call temporary. There's a facility that we've we built, uh, or our building currently, to allow us to still manage all of those elements of servicing that would have been done at Euston. So that's including train crew accommodation. So for the train staff will start their shift at Old Oak Common, as well as catering facility. In terms of the exact offering of catering, we're not there yet in terms of understanding the specifics, but we have a facility uh, available that will allow us to ultimately deliver that need um, as and when it comes online, effectively. Um, so we've had to relook at that, but it's not actually significantly changed the scheme in any real shape or fashion. So, which is positive from from my perspective, from a delivery perspective. Thank you. I've got one more in the room, and then. Um, <clears throat> thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, in terms of track layout and um, signalling, etc., um, what provision has had to be made to get Old Oak Common a terminus instead of a through station, which it would have been if we'd gone to Euston? So I haven't shown the track layout, unfortunately. Apologies for that. I can get that image next time. Um, underground, effectively, we have a switches and crossing at the left hand side of the station to the east to the west and there's an s and c to the east of the station but for old oak common operating as a temporary terminus all the trains coming from birmingham can get into all the platforms from a uh, from a through the s and c's that we have to the west of the site so we don't need to use anything east of the platform ends in terms of for you know moving shunting trains or moving them between platforms which is good so really the there's still some finality about where it, the delineation sits, but there will just be a delineation just off the end of the platforms at the appropriate distance, you know, in terms of uh, stopping distances, etc. But it will be capable and doesn't have to modify too much the system in terms of Old Oak Common West because of the tracks uh, structure already suited it, basically. So it doesn't have to come out. So it's it's basically the final configuration and the track layout supports the temporary state. Um, so. Yeah. Okay, there's a few questions online. I don't know if any of uh, those questions want to come off mute and ask their question, or I can read it out. No. I'm happy to come off mute. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt. You can hear me. Uh, it's Malcolm Dobell here. Uh, I'm thinking that the the clearly the sizing of the escalators and so forth uh, from the high speed trains to the um, intermediate concourses has been sized for interchange. But uh, how many, how long will it take to clear a 400 meter long train and a load of tra passengers uh, when they've all got to get off at Old Oak Common? How long will it take to get off? And and secondly, if most of them are then interchanging on to the network rail side. How long is it going to take to then feed them all through what looks like a bottleneck of this single bridge in the middle of the station? Yep, good question. So the question for those in the room who didn't catch it was about the interchange. How are we going to manage those 400 meter long trains decamping on to the platforms and then ultimately transferring over to the conventional station? Um, I don't have the time. I think it's approximately in, a, in the worst case around five minutes it would take actually to get from point to point. but. That's when we're sort of running the sort of worst case scenarios as part of the PED modeling. The, in terms of the, the way the station works, what I didn't show you is there's four points of access from below ground up to the central concourse. So that helps manage the distribution of um, the passengers from platform up to concourse. And then from the con up and over the concourse and over bridge, whilst it doesn't look massively significant here, it is certainly big enough. So we've got three up escalators effectively uh, and three lifts uh, that will support those interconnectivity. The key thing obviously is also making sure they can get on trains. I think that was the other point made. So the, the, key, the key piece of work that's happening at the moment is understanding exactly what train frequency we need on the Elizabeth line service to, to in particular, because most of the people will want to either get on, well, will we'll want to go to Elizabeth line as a view in the initial state, because those will be the passengers that historically would have been wanting to go to central London and onwards to Euston. So head modeling has been done to support sort of the infrastructure. So we know it works. 
but um, there's definitely still some work to be done to understand exactly how many trains. And that's also subject to, you know, the demand of Elizabeth Line, which we've seen fantastic demand growth, which is good. But that means the trains will be busier as they get to Old Oak, may have less capacity to take onward journeys. But that's that's effectively the sort of decisions that the government and Network Rail are looking at in terms of exactly how we commission and bring into use um, Old Oak Common. Thanks very much. Have that answered your question? Malcolm? Yeah, thank you. Okay, should we go back to the room? I think there was a couple of questions. Yeah. Dominic, from Principal Systems Engineer for Network Rail Consultant. Thank you very much for the presentation. Systems integration. Uh, you mentioned there the contractual mechanisms of forming an alliance to manage system integration. What's your understanding of your part in systems integration and ops readiness? You sort of put me on the spot here, aren't you? No. Uh, so, HS2. Um, we are taking the role of prime system integrator. So we have taken that as our client responsibility to manage ultimately the take accountability for integration because we've got many, many contracts, ultimately civils contracts for tunneling, station contracts, which have an element of systems a lot more than others, as well as the actual railway infrastructure. So at HS2, we've prime system integrator role, and then we've taken, um, we've basically disseminated that through spare specific contracts for all common we've got our contracting partner to be effectively the lead integrator for the station so they have an obligation and responsibility to manage the integration of the rail systems into the station so it doesn't just finish at a arbitrary line on the platform edge or whatever um, it's fair to say you know we're still developing exactly how we're going to get there at the end but that sort of prime system integration function has been stood up for a year and a half now very much based on some of that cross rail learning and trying to not just give it away uh, and say sort integrate because uh, that doesn't seem to be the model that we're, we thought would work. Yeah. Okay, thank you. there's uh, another question at the front. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Phil Schreier, I'm editor of Modern Railways. Yes, I'm a journalist, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, two things about the conventional stage, if I may. Um, one, uh, the Mayor of London and TfL are calling for level boarding uh, at the conventional station. Just wanted to understand sort of, so you've got curved platforms. I don't think that provision is made for that at the moment. If you were going to do it, I understand it's not a decision that's been made. Would, how easy would that be to do? And there's eight platforms, I believe. Are they all through platforms? So I think the idea was you'd turn some Elizabeth Line services round as whole Oak Common, um, which would be extended as the ones that terminate at Paddington at the moment. I'm not sure on that second point. Uh, certainly in the end state, the intention is that all trains do stop at Old Oak Common. So the, it, whilst it's through station, effectively every train will stop and will allow um, uh, trains to come on and off. In terms of the level boarding challenge, yes, it's a challenge because of the fact that we're delivering to network rail standards and, and structure requirements in terms of interoperability of railway. We've got multiple rolling, uh, rolling stock in that area. I, I, I can't comment actually in terms of where we're going to go with it because from a delivery perspective, we've just been told you need to deliver to the network rail interoperability requirements. That's what's needed. There are conversations between DFT, TFL and network rail to understand is that really the, the right solution and can we do something different? Does it work technically? Does it work from a best for program solution as well? So um, ongoing conversations that don't really relate to what I'm doing, if I'm honest, but happy to try and get information separate for you. Okay, thank you. Um, right. Let's go. Thank you. Um, West London is very close to the being structured changes. So, yeah, let me jump back and I'll help. Just oh, right, here we go. So, as you say, the green represents effectively the London Overground um, route, the North London line, which runs through the site. Doesn't run, as you can see, it doesn't run into our site, and we don't actually directly interface with it other than elements at the south where we're doing some enabling works. The West London Orbital scheme, which um, I'm not too familiar with, so you, know, you probably know more than me on, ultimately though has a station here, which is the 
Old Oak Common Station is proposed to be delivered as part of West Orbital. That connectivity has been integrated from a space briefing perspective for you know, walking routes. And so basically we've tested the modeling to demonstrate that you can get people from there walking or cycling into the station within the infrastructure we're building. But we're not actually doing any more than that. And we've not sort of directed to do any more than that. We just make sure that it can, our station can deal with the passenger numbers in terms of sort of stress tests against those numbers and it can. So um, that's something that's definitely, you know, from my perspective, really would be great for the area, really would be beneficial in terms of really getting unlocking the full connectivity. At the moment, it's sort of in the hands of others to determine exactly how we do it. And the, uh, I should mention that the Hive Road station, I meant, I showed that on the other map. It was originally proposed to be effectively to the north over here, and that was linked to the development in the area. Um, that is probably more on the shelf, so to speak, given the uh, ability to build on the specific land where that station was identified uh, is, is basically privately owned, so they don't have the ability to build on that land at the moment. But so the focus at the moment, I think, collectively uh, as a part of an industry is looking at Old Oak Common or whatever it would be called on the London Overground. And some of you may be working on that scheme, I don't know. So feel free to say more if I've said something wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to have a pause for a minute and see if um, anyone wants to ask a question online. Give Peter a chance just to have, take a breath, Thank drink you. of water. <laughs> uh, there was one question um, from Jeffrey. Um, he asked how many how many tons approximately is the is the roof going to be? <laughs> I don't know that, Jeffrey. Apologies. Um, I can find out, but uh, no, I don't know the answer to that. I know that we um, we definitely are trying to minimise that. We say lightweight. Of course, it's steel construction, so there's all relative terms on lightweight. But we definitely stripped out about seven thousand tons from the from the original scheme of that roof um, because we recognise that it's obviously a big um, construction challenge in terms of engineering, but also in terms of the, the sort of embodied carbon that it will be uh, representing. So. Definitely try to minimise it. Don't have a number. Sorry. Um, question in the room. If I have a question. Uh, I don't know whether you'll 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 be able to answer on tactile wayfinding and how you're approaching that for the station. Um, uh, is it going to have it? Uh, and uh, what what the what the approach is being taken? Hmm, good question. I don't know that one either, if I'm honest. But uh, I can definitely find out. Um, I mean, what I would say is that the HS2 inclusive standards have been definitely trying, well, they're trying to push, we're trying to push the boundary in terms of inclusivity. That's everything from how we're managing the lift access to in terms of you know, passenger facilities that we're providing. Naturally, doesn't answer your question, but I'm sure we can get some information as to exactly how we're dealing with tactile paving and, and tactile uh, wayfinding as a sort of topic. Oh, thank you. That's great. Um, and one more question from the room, please. question this is probably where my civil engineering uh, experience is going to struggle to answer in detail your question but um, I think roughly speaking don't quote me on this because I think it's roughly speaking station requires something like in, in a sort of full evac worst case mode of something like eight nine MVA something like that in terms of station supply we've got multiple obviously typical a b supply in terms of making sure we have redundancy that's from multiple sources one locally through Old Oak common and one through the trace that comes through to provide that um, redundancy in terms of the actual supply feed and of course we have ups systems within the station it's providing critical backup 
battery backup for those facilities that we need to ensure that evac purposes are are on available so emergency lighting emergency uh, wayfinding etc so i don't think i've answered your question but that's kind of context to what we're doing i think Ho hopefully that gives some flavor and we can chat afterwards and i can get some more information if you need okay I've got time for one more um so it's not fair. Uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. As a non-railway man, but uh, um, been uh, space and defence and and also uh, oil and petrochem. But you talked about um, the TBMs breaking through at the west end. Yeah. You drop TBMs in at the east end and sit them in at the end of the box. They sit there until you're ready to start tunnelling. Eastwards. Correct. Why are there kind of like two sets of TBMs and not the ones that come from the West End, shunt them to the far end of the station, and then they sit? Good question. I This is where you corrected me on something I said. So the, the specifics of what we're doing at the West is slightly different. So the West, we're actually launching the TBMs from slightly west of this image, from about here, going towards Birmingham. So they actually go in the opposite direction. And then between the TBM launch shafts and the station site, we do spray concrete lining, typical, I say typical, in London it can be typical, spray concrete lining and then secondary concrete reinforcement. The timing of the activities doesn't give us the opportunity to ultimately reuse those tunnel boring machines there. The tunnel boring machines going towards Birmingham will be starting shortly, but it's a two, two odd year program to do that tunneling, by which point we need to start the tunneling towards Houston. And that's why also we have two tunnel boring machines in both instances you know you could say why don't you have one reuse that one as well fortunately the program doesn't give us that opportunity because of the scale of the tunneling that we need to do ultimately um but yeah good spot because i've probably misspoke in terms of breaking through tbms All right, great question great answer. thank you very much um uh, i just wanted to um that's my thanks peter for for coming today giving us what uh, i thought a really uh, fantastic talk um been a really um, great overview of the HS2 um, scheme, um, but also quite an in-depth uh, dive into the Old Oak Common um, site. Uh, so, uh, I appreciate you being uh, able to give us so much detail um, and the updates of, of, of where you're at at the moment. It's, it's, it's clearly a, a huge project. Um, it sounds to me like it's in good hands um, to be an able a station um, in the not too distant future. Um, so I think all that's left to do is for us to give Peter a really, a really big applause. Yeah. Oh, good. So that won't be coming out for some.